ora koutou katoa. Welcome to Raw Politics, Newsroom's weekly podcast on the big political issues. I'm senior political reporter Mark Dalder. Uh, joining me from Auckland is Tim Murphy, Newsroom's co-editor, and Na- Newsroom's national affairs editor from Christchurch, Sam Sitchdeva. Hi, both. Thanks for, for being here. And, and, and how are you guys doing? Well, I think I'm less grumpy than the Prime Minister, who has been a bit short, red-faced and sarcastic with media, at least this week. I don't know how he's been in his cabinet room. We are determined to make sure that social investment moves from theory into actual action. It's really important that that happens, uh, and he's uniquely placed to do it. National has been fairly critical of him, apart from this. Simon Bridges called him a wokester. Well, I don't, I don't care. I mean, I'm the, I'm the leader of the National Party. I, I don't imagine his height has changed all that much, but um, the, the red face and sarcastic, yeah, that, that, that applies. Sam? Oh, very good. Thank you. Life's always great in the mainland. You guys should try it with everyone else fleeing from uh, Wellington and the North Island. Well, yeah, it would be lovely to have some natural light, and it looks like you've got some there and, and in Auckland. But It's the benefit of working from home, Sam. Yes, the benefit of working from home uh, in Wellington. You know, you think it just applies to the public sector, but it's everyone in Wellington actually has been forced into the office. Tried to work from home this morning, but the cops showed up and dragged me onto the train, and, and here I am. <laughs> Today on Raw Politics, uh, we're going to discuss how the government is less a government of governors and maybe more a government of managers. We're going to talk a little bit about the controversy within the government and without over the vote on Israel at the United Nations. And we'll cover the ANZ Bank's views on the capital gains tax, because that's apparently uh, something that we're talking about these days. And to wrap up, as always, we will offer you some recommendations. The weekly post-cabinet press conference on Monday saw an announcement that wasn't really on anyone's radar, a crackdown on the public sector working from home. Even several days after the fact, at least to me, it still feels odd that the government would dedicate such a high-profile media slot. It happens once a week. It's live streamed on all the big news outlets, websites, and, and YouTube, and forms the basis of that evening's TV coverage as well. But that, they would dedicate this, this big spot to an issue that seems basically irrelevant to the public. A press release? Sure, I'd understand that, but a post-cab is a different thing. And it's given us cause to reflect, Tim, you and I were chatting about this a little bit uh, earlier in the week, that that it sometimes feels like the government is more focused on managing the public sector than on governing both the public sector and New Zealand. You brought this up, so why do you say that, Tim? What what makes you um, look at the government through this lens? Well, that um, working from home decision just prompted the thought that really the Prime Minister and Minister for the Public Service you wouldn't think would be into the weeds as deep as saying to each agency and department, you've got to do agreements with your staff that lists that they are able to work from home at certain times, otherwise they've got to be in the office. Now, that would always have been, I think, regarded as, quotes, operational matters for departments and agencies. Uh, But in this government, operational is kind of used with forked tongue. Sometimes it's operational and they keep out of it, especially when there might be some political embarrassment because of what the operations in a department or agency have delivered. But sometimes they're right in there. And and I think, um, you know, that distinction between governing and managing is supposed to be in the public service and the model that all parties kind of have subscribed to that the government appoints the CEOs of these agencies and the CEOs manage the delivery in the policy context of that government. Um, They deliver how their people and their resources and their operations are delivered. Um, So I think, you know, there's, there's examples like that where they've made this directive, but there's also examples in lots of the Uh, statements of performance expectations from ministers to boards and ministers to CEOs uh, and those kind of instruments that are very detailed, very hands-on, even to the point of lowering considerably the ability of executives or boards to make decisions on on dollar figures so that where there might have been a 35 million or 50 million dollar kind of limit that they could go to now they're down to four or five without going back to the two ministers so they really want to get their hands on this now their argument will be that it's just been too loose it's been you know free range in the public service labor let it go loose costs are everywhere and the deep state can't really be trusted to get this under control unless they get their hands on it first 
and then free them. So they've got to kind of destroy this village to save it. Yeah, S- Sam, do, do you think it's that idea of, of a lack of faith in the public sector to manage itself that, that's driving this? Or, you know, the other the other kind of comparison people have made is it is a very CEO way of doing things, right? And Luxon is is happy to talk about how they're doing things differently in this government. Is this an example of that? It's just bringing that corporate culture into the public sector? Or is it that that distrust or something else entirely? Uh, look, I think it's a bit of column A and a bit of column B, right? They're, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, yes, you know, Mr. Luxon, our Prime Minister, loves uh, chunking down things through decision gates and having his quarterly action plans and, and bullet statements and whatever else jargon I've missed out that he um, is a, a fan of. So I think that sort of feeds into that a little bit. That, um, you know, of course, you're going to have this sort of uh, top down sort of imposition of things and, and be relatively granular in the detail. But I, I think Tim's right. There's clearly a sense of distrust from the current coalition towards the public service. Uh, you know, we saw a number of, of leaks early on in the government's term and, you know, they still continue, I think, uh, from time to time. So there's probably a sense that, uh, you know, public servants aren't, aren't on our side. You know, why why should we play nice or, or you know, try and um, cozy up to them when we maybe need to sort of uh, show a little bit of tough love and, and set a standard? And I think uh, the calculation is probably that uh, there's not going to be any votes lost in, in being seen to be tough on, on the public service and, and cracking down on them. If you've got people who are at private companies saying, well, look, I... Uh, I've had to go back into the office, and I think that was um, Luxon's argument and Nicola Willis that private sector firms are making their own decisions to to bring people back. So why should the public service get an exemption? But it was sort of interesting. I was looking at some of the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or X, and, and looking at the reaction to the PM social media posts. And there was quite a bit of negativity in there saying, you know, well, we, we just need, we, you know, this flexibility, who's going to want to spend two hours in, in traffic and, and so on. So, um, yeah, it doesn't seem to be a slam dunk, I think, in terms of how the public's received it. I mean, is is there anyone who really hates work from home other than employers who themselves are according to the research, even the stuff that Chris Luxon is citing, more likely, you know, at the higher ranks, the echelons of a company to be working from home themselves. Um, and it is the junior people who end up coming in anyways. I, I don't know. For me, it's an odd one, right? I, I think you're right. You, you don't lose votes really on doing this other than from the public sector, but probably uh, broadly not a group that was going to vote for you anyways. But uh, I don't know that you gain a vast number of votes either. So it still feels to me like a, an odd thing to front a post cab with. Um, one last question for you guys. We've talked about this being different from the managing versus the governing being different from, from previous governments. Is it problematic though? Is it inherently a bad way to, to be running New Zealand? Does it mean that ministers are uh, you know, not, they've got limited time, not dedicating the resources they need to the actual important decisions? Or is it, you know, like Luxon says, just a way of doing things differently? Well, it's how he rolls and it's how they're going to roll. And it might well be that they can redefine how you know, ministers, uh, parliament, government agencies uh, interact, that they're going to change it. That This orthodoxy that, you know, you set the policy, you appoint the key people, and then you stand back, uh, especially in the in the state companies and the business side of it, but even in the departments in this operational sense. It could be that they redefine that and say, well, that was a theory that, yes, national and Labor governments have adhered to over, what, a generation almost, but we believe there needs to be an interventionist, hands-on approach to change this country and this economy, and there's maybe merit in that. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's an inherently wrong approach to take. The proof of the pudding will be in the eating, so to speak. It'll just be a matter of you know how successful it is. Um, the other thing is that there might be a bit of a natural ebbing or recession in terms of the heavy hand of, of the coalition. Uh, we've seen a number of um, uh, public sector chief executives uh, step down. Their contracts have come up and they've, they've not gone again. So... Uh, you know, National Act and New Zealand First will have a chance to put their own people in and perhaps if they've got, um, you know, their own appointees who they, they have trust in and who buy into their vision that they might not feel the need to um, be so prescriptive or top down on some of these matters. I'm, I'm glad you said the proof is in the pudding, Sam. I was worried you might be mentioning a woke food that the public sector might uh 
might, might adopt, but but we've avoided that. So uh, the proof you know, of the sushi is in the rolling. <laughs> Last week, New Zealand broke from its usual Five Eyes partners in a key vote in the United Nations about Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories. New Zealand supported the non-binding resolution which ordered Israel to end its occupation within a year, but Australia, Canada, and the UK abstained while the US voted against. Uh, The final tally was 124 countries for, 14 against, and 43 abstentions. So broad support from it, including from some other partners of of New Zealand's, you know, developed European countries like France supported it uh, and uh, quite a few votes against from the Pacific. But that tends to be how these votes go in the in the UN uh, on Israel in particular. Back at home, Acts David Seymour says he's disappointed he wasn't consulted on the vote. Uh, but Foreign Minister and New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters pushed back, saying there are hundreds of UN resolutions a year and he can't consult on all of them. Luxon implicitly backed Peters in, in this kind of light war of words uh, in, in comments to reporters on Wednesday and in the House saying basically the same thing. If there's a big change in foreign policy, he'd expect consultation, but this wasn't that. Sam, can you give us a little bit of background here about this resolution? What did it say and, and why might it be so controversial? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. I mean, I think you've you've covered the key thrust of it, which is the the demand for you know an end to Israeli occupation. I think unlawful occupation and unlawful presence was the the wording and the resolution. And and we've we've supported or, um, previous uh, statements or resolutions to that effect in the past. I think what is different is the the time frame on it: twelve months which is is very precise, and that's actually one of the things where New Zealand uh, and Winston Peters sort of voiced a a bit of reservation, saying, look, we're not sure how practical or realistic it is, but we're still we're still going going to support this regardless on, on the broader principle. So, you know, look, it's proved contentious as you would expect with Israel, who who view it as a, a one sided resolution that it's um, you know, s- seeks to cast all the blame upon them and doesn't reflect the actions of, of Hamas in, in Gaza and, and the fact that there have been attacks carried out by Hamas um, on Israel. And, and the U.S. has, has um, swung in behind Israel, as it has on a number of, of resolutions previously. So I guess what's striking is the fact that um, you know New Zealand did break with our Five Eyes partners. We've previously had a bit of a, a trio going uh, with Australia and Canada, where we've been issuing joint statements in relation to the situation, the war in Gaza and, and Israel. So, uh, you know, the fact that those two countries chose to abstain, uh, whereas we went out on a little bit of a limb here to vote in favour of it, is is what's um, quite noteworthy, I suppose, that we're willing to to go against the tide and um, and uh, break from our sort of like minded partners. Tim, do, do you think David Seymour is right to be upset here? Is this something he should have be, been consulted on, or is he blowing it out of proportion? Um, I'm going to ask Sam's. Uh, sage counsel on this one because I'm not certain whether, I mean, I can see that Peters is saying we have hundreds of these resolutions that come up and we don't go back for, you know, express sort of sign off from coalition partners and so on. That's probably the case, Sam, but presumably on change of position or even timing of certain highly sensitive uh, votes, there would be discussion and consultation, wouldn't there? Mm, well, it's, it's quite amusing or ironic because Winston Peters was on the other side of a similar argument um, several years ago. I um, was reported on it at the time. 2016, the national government uh, co-sponsored a, a resolution at the Security Council in relation to the Israeli occupation or uh, settlements in, in the West Bank. And that um, created a huge stir. Israel withdrew its ambassador, recalled its ambassador from New Zealand, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu apparently told McCulley that, it, that New Zealand's co-sponsoring was was tantamount to an act of war, and Winston Peters was, uh, you know, one of the chief critics on the New Zealand side, saying, um, "Why was this not taken to cabinet? Uh, why did Murray McCulley make a unilateral decision?" And the um, defence from the government at the time was, you know, this is a, a long-standing position of New Zealand. We didn't need to do that, which is exactly the argument that Winston's making today. So um, slightly amusing. In terms of the actual merits of it, it, it sort of depends on whether you view this as a significant 
foreign policy decision, which I think is is something close to the wording in the cabinet manual. Um, it, it is a position that we've held for a long time. New Zealand has been a consistent uh, critic of of the Israeli occupation or presence in in, um, in the West Banks, and uh, and that we view it as illegal. So. Look, I think probably Winston is is right to say that it's it's not a dramatic change. Does the time frame change things? Putting quite a specific um, period on it, I I don't know. But I just find it amusing, given he was uh, you know on, the, on arguing the other end of the case, uh, you know, not that long ago. I'm curious, Sam. There's been kind of a uh, some discussion that this this does represent a departure for New Zealand. Because we voted in a way that our partners haven't, is it is it that New Zealand, in your view, has shifted its position, or that that Australia and Canada have shifted the other way? You know, if someone's moved, probably, but it, is it us who's moved? Look, uh, it's probably hard to say, but w- what I think is clear is that the New Zealand public uh, are, are not hugely sympathetic towards Israel. There are, you know, some elements, of course, and there's a, a Jewish community in New Zealand that has been quite um, uh, uh, strong in, in supporting the Israeli government. But I think overall, if you look across the New Zealand public, there's there's a fair amount of concern and support for for Palestine. So that might be reflected in New Zealand's position as opposed to the to those other countries. Um, you know, I think Australia, C- Canada, I'm not sure whether it's, uh, there's the same sort of dis- domestic unrest there. Although, interestingly, the UK, um, which has also abstained, they, you know, had the, the situation in Gaza played quite a key role in the, the election. Labour lost a, a couple of seats to pro-Gaza independence. So, um, it's not just a New Zealand thing, but maybe that is is weighing more into our government's considerations. I'm also interested in the domestic issue here, or the coalition dynamic, right? Because this is definitely not the first time we've seen David Seymour or Winston Peters take issue with a government decision in a way that that probably isn't quite how a coalition is supposed to work. But everyone just kind of hand waves it and moves on. And and it doesn't feel like there's long lasting fractures that are that are being made by these, these sorts of disputes. Do you think that Israel is likely to be a divisive issue or continue to be a divisive issue for the coalition because ACT does have quite a strong view on it uh, in the pro-Israel side and um, and National, I think, has generally more been aligned with the the kind of the MFAT view, the, the long-held positions on issues like the occupation. Do either of you, um, you know, is, is this something that we would expect to see further factors and, and dispute points on or just like some of the previous uh, issues, it's a one and done? Tim, I'll defer to you. Uh, well, look, I, I think this is again an example of this three-way grouping doing things differently. And, and you know, we didn't, we haven't had party versus party so obviously. Uh, we haven't seen examples of impatience or dissatisfaction aired leader to leader as obviously, I don't think, in our past combos. And yes, there's three this time in formal coalition, so it's a bit different. Uh, Luxon talks it up, doesn't he? At his press conference the other day, he was very much that we're a big, strong, um, kind of grown-up group who can uh, field, you know, criticisms internally and externally of each other, but on our core positions and on our central agreed uh, policies that we are, you know, foot sure and and four square, and we're going to go forward like this. So we're not going to let people try and wedge uh, whatever these small interactions are uh, into greater sort of diversion or division, at least, in in the coalition. So it's interesting. You know, these things happen, Mark, as you say, and we kind of just hear them think, oh, that's a bit sensitive and awkward, and then it moves on, and awkwardness becomes the norm in some ways. Yeah, I'm also interested because... I'm not sure how much this reflected in the public reporting, but David Seymour did kind of imply that he would have invoked the agree to disagree provisions of the coalition agreement if he'd been told by Winston Peters ahead of time. But because it's a, not a cabinet decision, those those provisions don't apply. So m- maybe a little bit of a technical process issue, and, and maybe that's the, the way that they're comfortable with describing it. The three of them is saying, well, this is a process dispute, not a substantive dispute. But it, but there is some sub, some substance at the heart of it, I think. 
Yeah, and um, you know David Seymour talked about the fact that as the MP for Epsom, he represents probably the largest Jewish constituency in in New Zealand. So I'm sure that's that's a factor as well, and and him wanting to make his his concern known. Um, look, I, I kind of agree with Tim. I don't think uh, any party is really going to throw their their toys out of the cot over this. They've got bigger issues to be dealing with. But um, it is it is a fraught issue, and they're very strong feelings on both sides. So I can imagine there'll be a little bit more discussion, possibly the next time around, even if it doesn't uh, amount to sort of full consultation. And you'd have to think that Peter's adopted a kind of it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission on this one. Our question for this week is: Why is ANZ wading into the capital gains tax debate? ANZ CEO Antonio Watson did media on Wednesday calling for a capital gains tax. We saw Christopher Luxon uh, push back on that, saying she just wanted New Zealanders to lose more money. And then Kieran McAnulty from Labour pushing back on that, saying uh, that Luxon's response was, quote, unbecoming of a leader. David Seymour, meanwhile, said that Watson was trying to dis- deflect from uh, anti-consumer policies and, and criticism of excess bank profits. Tim. Should we care at all that, that ANZ is weighing in on this, this issue? Big risk for a corporate leader. Uh, big risk for a bank, an Australian bank, you know, one of these easy to hit uh, consumer and political targets. Very interesting, though, that someone in that position on the, you know, that the, the business of that scale and importance to our economy uh, should raise this issue of fairness of a CGT. And I think it's been uh, fascinating, the response, because it because it comes from sort of almost friendly fire, if you like, for the centre-right. It's more difficult to deal with. And I think, though, that uh, there probably are more economically and finance-trained professionals and executives out there who see merit in a CGT than, than have put their heads above the parapet parapet to this point. So she she's come out quite early. But, you know, the IMF, the IRD, uh, our departing Treasury Secretary, another Australian, um, you know, might well just see that we're a bit of an outlier. And, that, and, that, and they're in a position, I guess, where they're not having to go to an electorate for a vote on this. So they can say it and agitate to a degree without all that electoral punishment that our leaders won't embrace. Yeah. Sam, you know, when Labour talks about a capital gains tax, things don't go well for them in the polls. And that's generally been interpreted as a, as, as a sign that the capital gains tax is just a, a political dead weight. It's not something that people want. Do you think that this uh, this sort of phenomenon, like Tim's saying, it's not just ANZ, Carolee McLeish, the outgoing Treasury uh, s- s- chief, chief executive, uh, has has said she thinks it's a good idea. There are plenty of other people, you know, I guess, coming out of the woodwork. Does that reflect a change in the mainstream view on it from the electorate, or or is it likely to, you know, make it feel like less of a, a controversial idea and more just a policy that can be discussed like any others, or is it is it always going to be, you know, the the capital gains tax the the um, dead weight for labour. Yeah, look, it certainly doesn't hurt, right? Having having elements of the business community um, weigh in in favour of this. Um, I think actually one thing worth noting is there has been reasonable support from from public polling in the past for a, a capital gains tax in principle. I think the issue is when you kind of drill down into the detail and figure out the exceptions and what's covered and, and what's not covered. That's when it starts to get difficult, and that's where Labour has found itself in trouble in the past. I think in terms of the fiscal's around it and and trying to explain how the numbers add up. So I'm, you know, am I confident they they would be able to avoid that trap this time? I'm not sure, just because it's happened so many times. Um, you know, it's like Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner just keep smashing into the same tunnel and over and over again. So, you know, how do they change that? How do they find a way through um, that hasn't hasn't worked from the previously? I, I'm not sure. I'm sure they'll be thinking about that a lot. And that's you know, one of the perks of being thrown into opposition. You get a little bit of time in the wilderness to um, to figure out how to sell these sorts of arguments. But um, yeah, I think it, it sort of is still to be seen how, how they can su- succeed where they failed in the past. 
Let's wrap things up with some recommendations. Something that you watched, read, or listened to this week that you enjoyed. Sam. I would like to recommend Thomas Manch's piece in The Post on New Zealand officials wargaming the US election. Um, he's OIA'd uh, a bunch of documents and briefings trying to get a sense of how the government is planning for the election and the potential different outcomes. Uh, we were caught on the hop in 2016 with Donald Trump, uh, and I think the the officials have decided that they, they won't want to make the same same mistake again, so it's interesting to lift the lid a little bit on, on what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, my recommendation for this week is uh, from Eloise Gibson in RNZ. It's a great story on how uh, the gas industry uh, went overseas and claimed that it successfully lobbied to kill the Climate Change Commission's recommended, uh, recommendation that there, there be a ban on new residential gas connections. Got all that sort of stuff about lobbying and, and topical things, but also the fossil fuel industry, very much worth a read. Tim. Um, back to capital gains tax for me. It's uh, from our colleague, John O'Milne, who has a piece where he just lays out, without comment, uh, seven views in favour, including Antonio Watson, uh, and the two current party leaders of the major parties against, and explains the positions uh, that the various people have on this. It's a good, simple read, just shows you a bit of uh, the breadth out there in the thinking. That's it from Raw Politics for this week. Thank you to our producer, Trent Doyle, and to our readers, listeners, and viewers. Have you got any burning thoughts that you would like to share with the team? Any questions you'd like us to read on air? You can email us at mark.dalder at newsroom.co.nz. That's M-A-R-C dot D-A-A-L-D-E-R at newsroom.co.nz. And you can find us here next week on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts.